of the Foreign Trade University. I would like to warmly welcome all of you to our special program today. Warmly welcome you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's our great honor to welcome Professor Roger Brooks Myersons, the 2007 Nobel Laureate for Economics, to visit Vietnam at the Foreign Trade University in the Four Asian Event Series, which is Dialogues to work a culture of pitch, we warmly welcome you. <laughs> the four Asian event series, which is Dialogues towards a culture of pitch, takes place in Vietnam and Thailand from 2012 and 2013. The Asian Bridges programs have been initiated and facilitated by the Vietnam based International Peace Foundation under the joint patronage of 21st Nobel Peach Prize laureates. The events build bridges to Nobel laureates with the local university and other institutions in the Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. The events aim towards a better cooperation for the advancement for peace, freedom and security in the regions with the active involvement of the young generation. Professor Myerson's visit to Foreign University today marks the start of the four Asian Bridges events. In today's program, Professor Myerson would give a lecture on leadership, democracy, and local government. And now I'd like to introduce our distinguished guests coming today. Please welcome Professor Roger Brooks Myerson, the 2007 Nobel Laureate for Economics. Please welcome Professor Myerson's foes, Mrs. Regina Weber Myerson. The Chairman of the International Peach Foundation, Mr. Uwe Morawetz. Attending the lecture today, we are very pleased to welcome the Ambassador of Germany, Ambassador of Sweden, and representative from other embassies in Vietnam. We really welcome you. Attending the lecture, we are very pleased to welcome outstanding economists, leaders of the governmental agencies, universities, research institutes, and NGOs, managers of enterprises, and press and media. Thank you. <laughs> From Foreign University, Vietnam, we would like to introduce Professor Dr. Huang Van Chou, President of FTU. Presented at the lecture today are the faculty members of Foreign Universities and especially more than 600 students sitting both here in this lecture hall and outside. Thank you. Warmly welcome all of you once again. <laughs> and now, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Huang Van Chou, President of Foreign University, to give the opening remarks. Professor Meissen addressed this problem by proposing the revelation principle 
wherein fires are offered a necessity for totally rebooting what the food plays for most food activities. Today, the theory plays a central role in many areas of economic and also political science. Professor Martin is also the author of Game Theory, Analysis of Conflict 1991, and Probability Model for Economic Decisions 2005. He also has published numerous articles in Econometrica, the Journal of Economic Theory, Games and Decisions, and the International Journal of Game Theory, for which he served as an editorial board for attendance. Professor Myerson has a PhD from Harvard University. He is a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, distinguished as a leading gentleman. Point University is one of the leading universities in the field of economics and business in Vietnam. FTU has been providing the country with high quality human resources. Our programs are conducted not only in Vietnamese but also in English and in collaboration with international partners, of which two bachelor programs and one master program are in partnership with the U.S. universities. I believe that the visit and the lecture of Professor Myerson today will greatly encourage our students to try that out to study and motivate our faculty members to do better research. Professor Myerson, please accept our most sincere thanks for your charming and gracious visit. We will remember this event with really a pride for a very long time. Our special thanks also go to Ministry of Education and Training of Vietnam and the International Peace Foundation for making this event possible. So may I wish you all good health and success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Huang Bat Chau, President of FTU. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite Mr. Wu Wei Morawet, the Chairman of the International Pitch Foundation, to give a speech. So, welcome to the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards the Culture of Peace. Facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with the Ministry of Education and Training and various local partners including some of the country's leading universities. And I would like to thank the Foreign Trade University and its president Professor Huang Wan Chao for hosting our event today. Starting this November, bridges will now be continuously held in Vietnam until March 2013, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics, as well as other keynote speakers, including Professor Ngo Ba Chao and the former president of the European Commission, Romano Prodi. The fourth ASEAN event series of Bridges follows a series of 450 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Cambodia since 2003 as an independent contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, and the media can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge, 
and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies, where politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by working together. After the success of its British programs in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Cambodia, the International Peace Foundation has been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international cooperation by expanding its program in Southeast Asia to stimulate the intellectual, scientific, and intercultural approach in the region. The fourth ASEAN Bridges series therefore continually takes place in Vietnam from November this year until March 2013 comprising events with Nobel laureates from all fields. The Nobel laureates will visit the region, not all at once, but separately, to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues hosted by local institutions during a continued period of five months. The topics of the ongoing events deal with the overall theme of building a culture of peace and development in a globalized world and with a wide range of issues in politics, economy, science, culture, and the media. They especially highlight the challenges of both globalization and regionalism and its impact on development and international cooperation. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue with peoples, people in other parts of the world as well as in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths as uh, to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates in all fields, which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the event may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event, but as a continuous process of synergies to make the events a sustainable success for Thailand and for Southeast Asia as a whole. I'm grateful to the Vietnam Honorary Chairman of Bridges, His Excellency Prime Minister Nguyen Tan Sung, to the Ministry of Education and Training, the Foreign Trade University, as well as to our, our other partners and sponsors, in particular the Asia Commercial Bank and BMW, who has enabled us to make the idea of bridges a reality. I would like to say thank you for everyone today for taking part in this program and may it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as a merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the 2007 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Roger Meyerson, and his wife, Gina Meyerson, who have agreed to come to Vietnam to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uwe Morawat, the chairman of the International Peace Foundation for your speech. Ladies and gentlemen, on this very special occasion to recognize the contribution of Professor Myerson to economics and to the Fort Jet University, the president of Fort Jet University decided to confer the honorary doctorate degree upon Professor Roger Bruce Myerson. And now you can see uh, Professor Myerson wearing a very special costume. Yeah. And now I would like to invite Professor Myerson to be on stage to receive the honorary doctorate degree from Fort Jet University. And now uh, Professor Dr. Hoang Van Chau, President of Fort Jet University, will confer the honorary doctorate degree upon Professor Myerson. Please be on stage right now.
Please give a big applause for our special mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Myerson and Professor Wang Wenzhou. Thank you. You can take some pictures with our present media yeah, to remember this very special moment with FPU. And now I would like to invite Mr. Murawek to be on stage to take the pictures with uh, Professor Myerson and Professor Cho. And uh, Mr. Chen Bang with Zoom from MLT, please be on stage right now to take the picture, please. Uh, now I would like to invite Mrs. Regina Weber Myerson. Yeah, please be on, on stage right now. Yeah, we just want to take in this memory in a very special occasion. Today we're after you. Yeah, please welcome Mrs. Regina Myerson. I'm sure we would have very, very nice pictures to keep this memory. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Myers and Professor Cho, please remain on the stage to a very, very important part of the program today, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud of our students because many of them have outstanding academic performance and we try our best to motivate and reward the best student by providing the good scholarship to them. Today, we would like to reward the five best students of FTU this year with a very special scholarship sponsored by Pinfong Bank and presented by Professor Myerson and the president of FTU, Professor Huang Bacho. And now, I would like to congratulate and invite five best students of FTU to be on stage right now. Student Dan Quang Hui, Vương Tô Nguyen, Trần Thị Kim Dung, Lê Hồng Ngọc Hân, and Nguyễn Ngọc Thiệp. Yeah, please be on stage right now, our five best students of FTU this year. And now, Professor Myers and Professor Wang Văn Châu will give you the scholarship sponsored by, by Tiên Phong Bank. Here we are, our five best students of FTU this year. They have a very, very good and outstanding academic performance, and they attended a lot of social activities in the national and local as well. And now I would like to invite Mr. Wilhelm, the General Director of Pinfong Bank, to be on stage to take a photo with the Professor Myerson, Professor Wang Manchao, and our best students. Once again, congratulations to our best students. Thank you, Professor Myerson, Professor Wang Manchao, and Mr. Wilhelm. Thank you. Professor Myerson, do you need to prepare for the lecture right now? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're coming to the most important part of the program today. We are going to the lecture on leadership, democracy, and local government presented by Professor Myerson. Before uh, Professor Myerson gave the lecture, I have something to tell you. Because uh, we uh, would have the Q&A part, so the Q&A part would be followed after the lecture of uh, Professor Myerson. So if you have any questions, please write down your question in a piece of paper with your name, your position, and your affiliation on it, and then give it to the organizer. So we will send the question to Professor Myerson. And now, please welcome again Professor Myerson for the lecture. Thank you.
Thank you for the warm welcome. It is a privilege to be here at the Foreign Trade University to be part of this, this ceremony for, for, for honoring the students. Um, I'm very, very grateful to, to the International Peace Foundation and all of its supporters for, uh, for bringing me here, and most importantly, to, 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 to all, all the institutions of, of, of Vietnam which have, have made this visit uh, so, so exciting for, for myself and my wife. We're very, very glad to be here and be your guests. I, uh, I should introduce myself as an economic theorist. I, I, am a, I do work, mathematical work in economic theory at the most fun, at a very fundamental and general level. To me, the advances that I have the privilege to be part of in economic theory and game theory and information economics were about broadening the scope of economic analysis. Uh, to recognize that beyond resource constraints, there are also what we call incentive constraints, problems of trust when people have different information. And this, these advances with mathematics in, 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 in economic analysis that I was a part of, I think they are important because they help us to understand the differences, to begin understanding how to think about economics economic systems and political systems as all being something that people do and as when we organize our societies and to begin to understand how to analyze free market capitalist economies and socialist economies and, uh, and other kinds of economic systems on a, unit, on a more general framework, on, as a part of a more general framework of how do we solve the economic problem. I am very aware when I come here that this country is determined to build a, a, a more prosperous and better society using principles that are not necessarily part of any one te template or model. But there are free market ideas and socialist ideas that are important in the, in, 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 in the, in the, question, in the organization of this country and the questions that people are facing about possible new forms of organization and reforms that people are discussing. The questions that you have here in Vietnam are very important, and I, as a social scientist, am very glad to learn about them. I hope that, that I may offer a perspective that is useful, and I look forward to questions that may help me to understand better both today and, and the rest of our visit here in Vietnam. So an economic theorist formulates logical models to understand the foundations of successful societies. That is, the advance to a slide. Excuse me. Uh, this is, this is, there, there. Uh, I want, as, as I tried to introduce myself as an economic theorist who formulates logical mathematical models to try to understand the foundations of successful societies, whether they be by, by, by capitalist, more capitalist principles or more socialist principles or anything in the, in the broad spectrum that includes these as, 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 as polar cases. Our models, we can make many nice mathematical models, but our models must fit the patterns of world history. Today I'm not going to try to talk about any technical models. This is a public lecture. But I want to talk about patterns in world history that I see, which I understand through the models that that, uh, that, I'm, uh, that we won't talk that, that are published elsewhere. I think you should know. I, I want you to know I believe that the the great differences in the wealth of nations. The, I like using the term wealth of nations, of course, because it's the title of a book by Adam Smith, and I'll quote it a little bit later. But the great differences in wealth of nations, which is the most fundamental question 
uh, in, 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 uh, in economics, the most important and the greatest question in economics. Uh, I think that those begin with, with, with political foundations. And so to understand economic development, I think we, part of what we understand has to be not just about how to regulate an economy and how to build a good market system or, or, or a better system of state-owned enterprises, but we have to begin by understanding something of how effective states are built by political leaders. I will argue, and I think one of the central points that I want you to understand, is that investment, investment in building a better economy depends on protection of property rights. But investment is protected locally. On the other hand, trade must be protected nationally and internationally. So development depends on both local and national politics. And so I want to talk about the building societies that by thinking, focusing on relationships between national politics and local politics in the organizations of our societies. And again, I, I come here today uh, understanding that I think the, the, the Republic of Vietnam today has a, a structure of, of, of a federal structure of the national, provincial, district, and commune levels, which seems to me a good adaptation to, to, under, to, to, solve, to solving these problems of building a great society. And, and thinking about those structures is something I want to particularly to, to suggest. That may be my most, most important message, is that it's worth thinking about our federal organizations. But let me start by saying, I, I think when I say that uh, understanding how great, prosperous societies are organized, must at some level begin with the role of our political leaders. I do want to start with the role of leadership. As a game theorist, I study constitutions. I've spent a little bit of time, for example, trying to introduce myself to, 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 to your country by reading the, the written, the, an English translation of the constitution of this country, because after all, those are rules of the game. Um, but I understand that un underlying any constitution is the rep reputations of the political leaders themselves. The state is a network of agents. Our governments, it's not government, governments, firms, all of our institutions are of course ultimately made of people. And economists study people. I should, I should warn you, economists like to study people under an assumption that every individual one of us is a selfish materialist. That's what we economists do, uh, uh, at least in my tradition. Everyone I know, I feel like I have some benevolence for others and I care about humanity. And everyone I know certainly seems to, and who I know well personally, seems to care about our country, their, love their friends, love, and, and care about all of humanity. But we economists like to think that when we study society under an assumption that every individual is going to behave selfishly, if we can design our institutions so that they will function well when everyone is selfish, then if people are actually benevolent, as in fact people most, mostly are to some degree, then they'll be even better. So we start with a conservative assumption. But, so the state is actually a network of individuals, of agents, who enforce laws and sustain property rights. Agents of the state could, of course, profit from abuse of their great power. And so they must be motivated by expected rewards for good service to the state and the public. We economists have a phrase I've highlighted on the slide, agency rents or moral hazard rents as meaning the rewards that someone has to get, not necessarily because he or she is such a good person, but just because he or she has exercised great power that could have been used corruptly. And in order to motivate good use of that, they may have to be allowed to enjoy material rewards greater than other people. Any political leader in any system needs a reputation for reliably rewarding the services his or her active supporters and agents. This to me is one of the a good beginning of an understanding of theory of politics. And the state must protect these, these, these political supporters' rights to these rewards. 
This, to me, is the beginning of property rights. It's the primary property right that we must see in any system. Now, that begs the question, are property rights protected only for a small elite who are active supporters of the leaders of the nation? That has certainly happened in many parts of history, uh, less in the world today. But, or are property rights protected to, you know, to, a, to everyone in a circle of trust that extends out to, a, to embrace the entire population? Membership in the securely protected group requires some political power, some voice, so against a leader who fails to protect these rights. The only way we can be really guaranteed that our rights will be protected is if a leader who fails to supervise to guarantee that the state will protect us would then be, see his political career in trouble. That's a reason why, under any system, there, there's political, the top leadership sometimes would like to have a smaller circle of elite. But people in the circle of trust can invest in the state, driving growth. And what we understand in societies in the world today is extending good protection of law to all the people of the country creates a country in which all the citizens can feel safe in investing. And, and, and that is, is a fundamental key to, to, to prosperous economic growth. Please, when I talk about leadership, let me pause for a minute and say, I am very aware, I think everyone must be very aware, but I, as someone who does not know your country well, recognize that in the struggle decades ago between my country and this, and, 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 and this, and this country, the struggle in which, in which your government prevailed, it, among the many things which we must remember, in this, in this day when now our countries are, are, are have gone from adversaries to, 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 to warm friendship, but we must still remember much about this. One thing I must recognize as a social scientist is, is, that, is that your leadership, your country prevailed in that struggle because of leadership that had a quality of extending a, a network of trust. Clearly, it was essential to the victory that the leaders of this country could inspire and, 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 and create a network of trust that extended broadly throughout the population. Millions of people felt that they knew that their part in, in, in that struggle would be recognized and rewarded. That is a great asset, a great political asset that I want to pay tribute to because it is an important part of the history of the world and I, and I cannot speak in Vietnam without paying homage to that. But in any when there is no challenge, when there is no external challenge to a, a ruling elite, there is likely to be, over time, an inevitable pr pressure among those who are privileged to draw the circle of privilege a little bit more narrowly. And that endangers reducing the set of people who feel they can invest. Let me see if I get this right here. Yes. I, I would like to show you here a nice quotation from Adam Smith. Um, that uh, where he's, he's, he, the base, he argues that in understanding the economic development of England in 1706, 70, 1776 when he was writing, that although much, that the most important element may have been the extension of basic political rights in the political system of England, the democratic political system of England, to, to a very large subset of the population. It was not then a majority of the population, but a very large subset of the population of England in 1776 had votes. And that this was important. Let's see if I can read this. I hope this slide is visible also outside. Uh, at the bottom, let me start, it's, it's written in a language I find difficult, but stuff, at the bottom he says, the laws and customs that were favorable to the yeomanry, yeomanry is a word in English I don't speak anymore, uh, the yeomen are, are the poor farmers. Uh, who may not own any land, but at least have a piece of land that they can work, that they rent from someone else. That, this, that there were laws and customs that were favorable to the yeomanry, uh, that contributed more to the present grandeur of England than all England's boasted regulations of commerce taken together. Almost everything that economists have taken from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is the idea, the most important idea that economists have taken from the Wealth of Nations in the 200 plus years since he voted. 
is that we should have better regulations of commerce and industry. That we need good laws to, to sustain a good marketplace. But here Adam Smith says something else is more important. What does he say? He says that these yeoman farmers, often they, they had a lease of, it was of 40 shillings a year, whatever that was, entitled these yeoman farmers to vote for parliament. And as most of them had, had these qualifications, he says, um, the whole order had some respect from the authorities because they were voters. And because of that, he says, um, he says, there is nowhere in the world except in England where peasant farmers could improve their land, could invest in making their piece of land more productive, and be confident that the landlord would not raise the rent, even though they had no written contract. Why? So he's, and then he says, that his point is, these peasant farmers felt that they could make their land more productive, and the, and, the, and the landowner would not raise the rent. And therefore, our fields in England are, have, been, have been improved, and our land is more productive, and our agricultural productivity is greater than any other country in the world, and that's why we're richer. And what is it? It's that a, a system of politics lays the groundwork for a guarantee of, of secure property rights that, that, that invites everyone, even the poor farmer without a, a lease, with no contract on his land, no guarantee of his rent, to improve the land and make the country richer, and increase the gross domestic product. opposite of what Adam Smith is, is, is praising. Uh, when the English uh, began to take over India in, in, in the 1700s, at the same time that Adam Smith was writing, uh, they established, in, when they were first taking over India, they established in many parts of India a feudal system. They, there was a, the term was zamindar. Uh, they, they, they granted local individuals, local, local big shots, local, local people, uh, certain local individuals would be, would be given zamindar status, which meant that they would have the rights to collect taxes from a group of villages. And they also had basic re responsibility for law enforcement and keeping the peace in these villages. And therefore, they were basically a local feudal lord. Uh, these zamindar feudal rights were, could be passed on to their children, they could sell them, they were basically a property right. The people who held them, who held these rights in, in colonial India, now have literally a vested interest in, in the British rule. And they therefore could be counted on to keep their part of India quiet. Later on, when the British were, were expanding their, their, their control in India to, to, to fill up the entire, the entire subcontinent, they felt more confident, and, and English writers observed that this feudalism was very inefficient, and they established other forms of governance, such as giving some power to local councils, or giving, uh, or, or, or bureaucratic administration by, 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 by professional bureaucrats. Uh, 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 but this property of giving local, creating local feudalism was a very effective way of, of establishing political control but at a very great economic cost. It is, its effects were so stable that 50 years, 50 and 60 years after the end of, end of independence, after the end of the, the colonial period, in 1947, when India became independent, all of these Zamindar rights were completely erased. But nonetheless, those regions, where those districts, where the English created feudal rights, the legacy of inequality of power continues to have measurable effects. Uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Lakshmi Iyer found in 2005 lower wheat yields, higher infant mortality in the districts that had, where the British had ruled by feudal government. I want to suggest that as we look around the poor, poorest parts of the world, we may find that much of it is due to such legacies of 
both colonial and other traditional forms of governance, where people establish control the easy way by, by, a, by a feudal system that has such a, 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 a deep economic cost. But the broader lesson is I want to suggest that analysis of economic development is incomplete without seriously considering the nature of local politics and local governance. One other example I'd like to give you in the understanding, for example, the rise of, of, of England to, to be so important. The, the, the industrial, before the Industrial Revolution begins in England, perhaps the most important economic event that's not so well known in the, during the 1700s, during Adam Smith's lifetime, was the development of the world's best road network. The English developed new technology for roads and built the best road network that, that, that any country had ever seen by, a, by a, an institution called a Turnpike Trust. The Turnpike Trust was a corporation that was run by the local, rural local government. And they, the, lo the, ro the, 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 lo the local rural bosses in, in the counties of England, uh, they were called the Justices of the Peace, set up an, a locally controlled corporation that set up toll booths. They would improve the road so people could travel on it even in the rainy season. And they could charge tolls. Now, if you have a bunch of different toll roads, and people want to get from, from here to, to several hundred kilometers elsewhere, and they're going to have to go through several toll booths, any economist will understand that there's, that, each, that there's an externality between the different toll roads. And each one would like to charge the largest part of the toll. Uh, so it needs to be nationally regulated. The national road system needed to be nationally regulated. But now there's a problem of trust between the national government and the local governments. The local governments may fear that if they, because improving the roads needs to be done by local labor and local management, they need to, to feel they're going to profit from, from, from the improvements. But once the improvements are in place, there's a danger, because it has to be nationally regulated, that the national government will be tempted to expropriate the rents. So you need trust between the local government and the national government, in order for the local authorities and the national authorities. The local authorities need to know the profits of their investment will re remain locally. England was go is governed by a parliamentary system. That means the national leadership was responsible to local leaders, to, lo to, to, to locally elected officials who represented these local elites, the same local elites that were running the, tur the turnpike trusts. That meant, I want to argue, you should recognize that Parliament made it possible to hold local bosses accountable under national law without threatening local the whole system of local privileges. Because ultimately, the local leaders who were being held accountable nationally were going to be held accountable in front of the court of, of their peers, of other of a parliament that was composed of representatives of all local elites. I've also argued that the fact that English towns were represented in parliament had a lot to do with why the English towns were more able than, say, cities in Poland or Spain to create local marketplaces, uh, which made the cities more prosperous and confident that national authorities would not then come in and tax away the benefits of prosperity for other national priorities. If we look, I want to report to a good book in English by Albert Feuerwerker, in, uh, written in 1958, on the, the first industrialization in China under the Qing Dynasty in the, in the, in the 1800s, in the 19th century. Uh, Feuerwerker reports that it, of course, as technology, as foreigners brought the first brought technology from modern shipping, telegraphs, and railroads, uh, brought news of this to China, local people began to set up corporations to, 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 to bring this technology into, into, into each country. And, and I, I don't know the history of, of, of Vietnam, but I know that in China, there were corporations that were set up, each of, which, each of these corporations uh, that, were, that were bringing modern shipping telegraphs and railroads uh, to China were sponsored typically by a provincial governor. But the imperial government could not restrain itself from expropriating the profits of these corporations. The Grand Secretary in 1899 famously made a tour of the South, uh, and auditing the books of each of these companies, 
and then announcing a tax that was based on whatever they had, whatever profits they were saving for future investment. Uh, I don't think it's as well known that the, the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1911, what happened? What really happened that provoked it, although there were, there were revolutionary movements, the actual fall begins when the national government decided to, to, to nationalize the railroads. The imperial government decided to nationalize the railroads. Uh, economists, it makes a lot of sense for railroads to be run on a national level, as I've just said. There are national externalities of the railroad network. Sounds like a good economic idea. The problem is the railroads were run, were, were, that existed were being run by corporations that paid their profits, to shared their profits with provincial governors. So this was the national government expropriating profits that belonged to the pr provincial governors, and the provincial governors en masse lost faith in the national government, and that, and that was the end of the Qing dynasty. Uh, I would argue, as an economist, who admires greatly the, the growth in, this, in, in, in Asia and has, has, has looked in particular at, at the growth of China. But, uh, actually, I'm quoting a work here by Barry Weingast, who uses the phrase market preserving federalism in a paper that he wrote in the 1990s about, about growth in China. The, the conditions for, for the, we may think that the, we may, we may re recognize the, the c conditions for successful growth given that. Uh, but as I, let me repeat the phrase I said before. The property is protected locally, but trade has to be protected nationally. The economic growth requires central leadership that is strong enough to, to prevent local leaders from establishing local monopolies and from, electing, from creating barriers to, to, to trade between the different regions in order to protect their local businesses. So the national leadership needs to protect national trade throughout the entire nation. But the national leadership also shouldn't be so strong that it can at any time come in and, 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 and expropriate uh, local profits. So the, needs, the national leadership needs to be weak enough in comparison with the, with the provincial and district and local governments so that the, the lower levels of government, the people at lower levels, can be confident that profits that are earned by local investment will stay locally. I think one might say that the history of, of, of the world is a complicated affair, but one might say that, 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 that China had a period in the, in the imperial government when, when the central government was too strong. Uh, there was a period of chaos when the central government, obviously, of, 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 of warlords, uh, when, 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 uh, when China was, was, was impoverished by the lack of a strong central leadership, uh, and the government of China today has a balance, as, I, as, as I'm learning in Vietnam, there may also be between central authorities and, and provincial authorities and lower level local authorities who each would have a constitutional allocation of power. And that to me may be important. It was lacking, I argue, in, in the Qing dynasty. So a key constitutional question I ask is how are governors chosen? And, and, uh, in any political system, uh, our governors and our mayors are crucial links in a chain of a network of trust that must link the top national, connect the top national leadership with people throughout the country. And so I want to focus for just a minute in thinking about any political system on how are, how are provincial and, and, and municipal leaders chosen. It, and it is a good question to ask about any country. Uh, central appointment allows the national leaders to use these valuable offices of mayor and governor as rewards for their supporters. But then mayors and governors rely on their relationship with the national government more than they rely on building trust with local people. So such centralization of the profits of local government tends to weaken the state outside the capital. I've got a reference here to a book by Robert Bates in, in 2008 where he talks about the terrible problems of, 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 of failure to develop in Africa and, and, and diagnoses much of it as coming from governments that in, for this kind of reason uh, were very weak outside the set of the capital because they, they insisted on the, the, the privilege, the, 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 the rewards of power tended to be distributed only to people closely around the, uh, uh, the, 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 the presidential palace 
or to local traditional feudal chiefs in, in, in the region, the provinces, and the networks of trust uh, of government, trust in government couldn't extend to much of the countries, which then becomes desperate, of course, desperately poor. The alternative constitution is to have constitutional power sharing uh, with autonomous local leaders, which can be by decentralized democracy, by uh, federalism that could be feudalism. But in, a, in federal systems, national leaders' reputations for respecting the privileges of lower levels of government become essential for building strong political coalitions. This week, there's a national party plenum in Beijing. It is not clear to an outsider, certainly not to one who doesn't speak Chinese, but to, I think, how the decisions were made of, about who should be on the Central Committee. But I feel sure, as a social scientist, I believe, that the reputations of, of members of the national leadership for dealing in reliable, fair, predictable ways with the, local, the leaders of the provinces and districts and municipalities in China, their reputations for fair dealing are an essential part of the people who will be voted into the, cent the highest levels of power for the coming term in China. That, that's what I see as a social scientist, and that's because they have an effective, what I would call an effective federal system. Democratic decentralization, in which local governors and mayors are chosen with voting by the by, with, with, with input from free voting from the, from the electorate that gives voice to, to the common people, that enlarges the political the circle of political trust that enables more people to invest securely. And that's where I want to refer back to my story from Adam Smith about the yeoman farmers who, because they had the rights to vote, were able to invest, felt secure to invest, and enrich the England. Let me finally say a little bit more about, uh, because I've been talking about England, I've been illustrating my ideas with, with English history, and I'd like to say something about, uh, in, indeed, with English history in the 1700s, when only a minority of the population voted. I'd like to carry things a little bit farther forward and say a little bit about the United States of America, my country. Uh, at, in, in the rights to vote were extended to all of the adult population, all of the adult male population in the 19th century and the early 20th century, at last to all of the adult population, men and women, the rights to vote were extended in the 18th, from the 18th century to the 20th century in England and America. One of the things I want you to know about the extension of, of voting rights in England during the, 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 during the 19th century, during the 1800s, is that people in England at the time observed that that changed the nature of politics when, when more thousands of people were voting. Instead of promise, politicians promising to do individual, to get votes by doing individual favors for individuals, when, as, when there are more voters, it, it's difficult to make individual promises to so many voters. And it become, the nature of politics changes and politicians begin to run on a promise of I will create more public goods, support a government, I will work for a government that gives roads and schools and clean water uh, 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 to the population, so better social insurance programs. Uh, so running the nature of politics changed as the as, as more of the population, as more as the number of voters increased. It changed the nature of politics, I believe, to encourage politicians to run up to cultivate a reputation for generating good public services. I want to make a statement, a general statement, about how, how what a hypothesis that may or may not resonate with you about, about, about successful growth. People have had many theories of development. The question of what of what makes how do how, how do poor countries become wealthier? How do we increase our, our per capita gross domestic product, our, our material output in the country? Do we need more steel mills? Do we need more human capital? The answer is we need to increase the supply of many things. Please let me suggest that a, a key to successful development may be to increase a national, our national supply in each of our countries. Our national supply of 
individuals who have good reputations for spending public funds responsibly. We need roads, we need schools, we need, we need basic law, enforcement of law, that all of which costs money. And we have to be able to entrust our taxes pause and say in America today there's many people who say the less taxes the better. I think I'm not one of them. I think we, we, need, we need more taxes and, and I, we, I think if you look at the statistics you'll see richer countries devote, which are spend a larger percentage fraction of their wealth on taxes to support public spending than poor countries. As countries get richer statistically the richer countries seem to spend a larger fraction of their gross domestic product to support that a much larger absolute amount on taxes which are then spent by the, by the government. I think it's not, it could be, many economists may think that it's because as we get richer our taste for public goods increases. I think it's just the opposite. I think that, that richer countries become richer because they, as, as governments can be, governments are just networks of people and as we be able to trust that our governments will spend the money, our, the tax money, on actually providing the, the roads and schools that we need, uh, then we, we consent to, to be taxed more, one way or another, uh, when we know we, that, that we can trust our leadership more. And, that, and, and mechanisms to make sure that everybody in the government will, will spend the money efficiently is very difficult. In my country, there is still intense distrust, and we we have corruption. There's corruption in every country. But systems of controls. What we need are leaders who who have good reputations for, for using public funds responsibly. Democratic competition, democracy, which is based on a theory that we're going to reduce the cost of government and get better government by asking our leaders to compete for power. Uh, Barack Obama had been in power for four years, and we know what he had done, but his opponent, Mitt Romney, had been governor of Massachusetts. And he had also spent billions of dollars of public money in Massachusetts, and he'd spent it well. So we had a good choice. And having a good choice meant the winner, who was the incumbent, President Barack Obama, had to work very, very hard to credibly convince people that he, that he would govern the country well, because he had an opponent who we also knew, based on his own record, would govern the country well. So what I want to suggest is that local, how do we create this supply of, of leaders, the surplus of leaders with good reputations for spending public funds responsibly? And to me, I think local governments, beyond protecting property rights, also provide, uh, uh, increase our supply. They create, local governments provide more opportunities for different leaders to show us what they can do with public funds. As power is devolved from national government to local government in, in different countries, the result may be, well, the result certainly will be an increase in local corruption. Corruption is where the money is spent. More money is spent locally, more, there will be more corruption locally. But there will also be more local officials who ma manage to preside over governments local governments that were less corrupt than average. And people will then say, ah, there's a leader who actually can deliver something more than the average leader. Wouldn't it be nice if this was the leader of our country? And of course, those local governors and mayors are thinking, yes, it would be fun to be, uh, to be prime minister instead of being local, local, local chief. So, so it creates a competition to prove, and I would argue that in each of our countries, we deserve to have our leaders competing to show us that they can do better than others. About the history of the United States, let me simply say in brief, you should know, I want you to know about my country, the United States of America. It was founded by a revolution in 1776. Actually, I think in that revolution, probably, I don't know, but, but uh, I don't know whether a majority wanted to separate, separate from England. Many Americans wanted to be independent, but many Americans uh, wanted to be loyal to England. We now call the ones who, who the, the revolutionaries patriots, and uh, but the, there were loyalists who would have been the patriots if, if, if the revolution had failed. But uh, the most important thing I want to show is it was a revolution of 13 provincial assemblies. 
There were 13 separate colonies that had 13 separate provincial assemblies, each of which had a representative from each of the, the local communities in the colony. And these people decided they wanted to be the government, and because they, are, they won, they established a government. And the government had a, they created a, con a national congress above them. But the United States was founded with, multiple, with power devolved to the lower levels. The national government has become more powerful over the 230 or 50 years history since the revolution. But that meant the, the, the basic story of the United States of local representatives from every town and, co and, and county going to the 13 separate provincial capitals and forming a government and then forming a national government meant that the United States from its very beginning was rich, was well endowed with local leaders who had, good repu who had already been governing, who had re good reputations for spending public funds responsibly. What they did was they had some of the government power and some of the financial power before the revolution. They shared it with, with, with governors sent from the, from, by the king of England. And afterwards, they had 100%. But they already had good reputations. And, and this supply of leaders with good reputations throughout this, the, the 13 colonies was, I think, what enabled the United States to be such a powerful and, and, and successful country from the start. It is, I think, the secret of American success. Uh, so let me finish, let me conclude. Hello. I'm trying to go forward to one more slide, and it's not going. Hello. Does anybody control the, uh, we've got, thank you. So let me conclude. Uh, this, I, I, the first point I tried to make was that we should recognize that trade is protected, nas is protected nationally, but, but investment is protected locally, and that becomes one reason uh, just to think that the, 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 the separation of powers between national and, 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 and provincial and local governments is, is important in the organization of any society, uh, in your country and in mine. And the second part, I tried to talk also about competitive democracy. Uh, uh, and let me say, I, I've used the word democracy. I, 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 give, I should give a definition. It's, a, it's an ancient Greek word that many people use. I should say, I want to use democracy in a very broad sense. And so I want to say democracy denotes any system in which leaders can get greater responsibility only when they earn trust and approval of more citizens. That, it, that to become, to rise to the highest level of power requires uh, that a leader, a, politi a polit politician, must get indications of approval of, of the Many people, many common citizens, feel that this, that this political leader has earned our trust. Let me say, the United States and Vietnam have very different political systems. But you do have your, your, your members of provincial councils and the National Assembly run in competitive elections, where, where every Vietnamese citizen I know has the right to indicate approval or disapproval. And, and so I am very impressed with the, the potential importance of that. Uh, in, in, in your system, and I'd like to learn more about that. The performance of, of democracy, I would argue in general, however, depends on interactions between the local and national levels of politics. I've argued that democracy at the higher levels becomes more competitive when people, when challengers have opportunities first to prove that they can do a good job at lower levels, and then offer themselves as candidates for power at higher levels. So people who've done a good job as, as, as district, uh, uh, district council, chief of the district committee uh, in, in, at a district level, can, can they then offer themselves as a candidate for national assembly and become a strong candidate for, uh, for, for chief of a provincial uh, council? Uh, that would be a question I'd like to ask. Uh, the possibility of democratic advancement to higher office offers lower level incentives under such a system. Democratic advancement, that's a very important term. Advancement only with the approval of the general population. Uh, the possibility of advan democratic advancement to higher office can give officials more incentive to provide good service at lower level. On the other hand, local democracy becomes more competitive when different groups in the, in the National Assembly can sponsor alternative local candidates. Let me say, I am from Chicago. In Chicago, there's only one party 
that can ever win offices. It, we are a one-party city, the Democrats, if you don't know that. However, there is another party in the United States that's called the Republican Party. And the Democratic leaders of Chicago know that if they became so corrupt that they were not generating good public service, they couldn't prevent the Republicans from actually nominating a candidate for mayor who might actually win because the, the votes will be counted, uh, but it probably won't happen in my lifetime. But we have better, what I'm saying is the better the Democrats, the, even, with, even with only Democrats in Chicago, I think we have a better quality of government because of the possibility of another faction uh, nominating opposing candidates. The value of federal democracy is manifest, as I've argued, in the history of the United States. So I haven't tried to provide a theoretical model. Let me conclude by saying I don't think it's always been manifested in American policies. Uh, as an example where, where, where the lessons of American history were not applied, I think, the United States, after being attacked by uh, agents of the Taliban government uh, in Afghanistan when we participated in, 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 in in the overthrow of that government and trying to establish a new government, we said, we'll only do it if it's a d democracy, but if we tried to establish a centralized presidential democracy in Afghanistan, where the only office that counts is, 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 is one, uh, and I think that is an example of just, of, of the, 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 everything in American history should have said that that was to be an exercise in failure, and I'm sorry that it's been as difficult as it has. Anyway, let me conclude with that and say I hope this, that I've raised some questions and offered a perspective, but I look forward very much to, to questions from the audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Myers. And now we will move to the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please write down your questions in the pieces of paper. We have some assistance to help you, and we will send the questions to Professor Myers right now.